everybody. I'm Ram Yapuri from the Sun Paris Institute. We're happy to have you all here and to have one more lecture in our uh, ongoing lecture series, the Bill and Sally Hamburg Distinguished Peacemakers Lectures at AUB, uh, which has one or two more lectures to go, and then it'll have, we'll end up with around 12 altogether, which will eventually be compiled and edited into a book. And um, we're very happy to have Aaron Miller with us. Uh, Aaron is um, very experienced, uh, former American official, and now he's at the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars, and has written uh, quite a few articles on a book that came out uh, last year, and he had an article that just came out uh, about two weeks ago in Foreign Policy Magazine, which I recommend you read. He'll probably tell us a bit about what's in it, The False Religion of Middle East Peace, and why he doesn't think there's any real chance of a breakthrough right now, and what the U.S. is doing or not doing, uh, which is, will be part of his talk here today. But Aaron has uh, uh, 26 years, I think, of his experience in the State Department, uh, working at various levels, directly in the negotiations and other support teams. And, um, and in fact, uh, one of the reasons I invited him is because he, had, uh, first of all, his experience, second of all, the fact that American peacemaking wasn't very successful. And I know Aaron is a frank and honest person, I know that from personally knowing him for some years and hearing him speak and reading his articles. And I think I thought it would be interesting to hear his views about why American mediation didn't succeed very much in recent history, uh, and what he thinks may be the reasons, and are there anything, uh, any changes that could happen uh, now that might perhaps make it, uh, make things different. And what does he uh, recommend for the future? You've uh, all probably seen his biography, and I notice I won't repeat it all, but he has significant uh, experience uh, in the State Department and negotiations and the policy planning staff, and was decorated for uh, distinguished, uh, superior, and meritorious uh, honor awards uh, for, his, for his work. He has a PhD in American Diplomatic and Middle Eastern History from the University uh, of Michigan. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Aaron Hart. Never had a chance to see anything, literally never. I don't think we spent the night once uh, in a dozen trips. Um, Arab Israeli peacemaking related and other uh, crises related travel when I was working. So this is a phenomenal opportunity. You have an opportunity, it's also my first time at UB. It's a gorgeous place. You've been given a real gift, um, and I hope you appreciate it. It's certainly nothing like, uh, like Washington. Uh, I had the honor and privilege over the course of the, almost 25 years, which is a very long time since I have a 30-year-old daughter and a 26-year-old son. Doing anything for 25 years is a very long time. It's actually a quarter of a century. To uh, work for six secretaries of state, George Schultz to Colin Powell. I resigned from the State Department in January 2003, not over principle. Um, only two secretaries of state in the history of our republic have ever resigned over principle. So when you get to be the Secretary of State and you were given the opportunity to work closely with Secretaries of State in defense of the American national interest, um, it's an imperfect process uh, about which I hear more. But I, did, I resigned because I realized that there was very little opportunity. Um, it wasn't George W. Bush related. <laughs> I left because I 
reached the analytical con conclusion that prospects of meaningful negotiations and agreements between the Arabs and Israelis was well out into the future. I also reached the conclusion that after 16 years, eight under Bill Clinton and eight under George W. Bush, roughly from 1992 to the present, that America had been failing, or to be more generous, not succeeding in Arab Israeli peacemaking. When I started in this business, I believed, deeply believed in three basic propositions. The first was that there was something called an equitable and durable Arab Israeli peace, and not perfect justice. You know, I'm 61, nobody in life gets 100%. Not in the marriage, not in the business proposition, not in the friendship, and certainly not in the clothes. Nobody gets 100%. There's no perfect justice. I'm not a religious person, but this side of heaven, I've persuaded myself there is no perfect justice. But I thought that there was a solution that I believed was equitable, that is to say it would meet the core needs and requirements of the Arabs and the Israelis. And it was durable. It would actually last. That was the first proposition, called an article of faith. Second was the negotiations. It was the only way to reach this equitable and durable solution. Now, those negotiations might be preceded by violence, by trauma, by war, by insurgency. And they were. Most of the most, the three breakthroughs in the history of the Arab Israeli problem, and there have only been three. That's it were all preceded by violence, insurgency, and war. Pain. But pain accompanied by gain. That is, in an essence, why negotiations work in the end. It is the pain-gain balance which kicks in, moving parties to make decisions, but also offering them not just disincentives, but incentives as well. So I believe that there was a negotiated solution. Uh, negotiations are not perfect. They're based on human frailty and weakness. They're based on domestic politics. They're based on the need for compromise. And they take time. In the patient world of the Arab Israeli conflict, it's one thing we've been led to believe people don't have time. And finally, the third article of faith is that America, could drive the train. We couldn't impose because we're not strong enough, smart enough in a world of small tribes to impose. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon. Where, where would the list start and where would it end? Small tribes who have willfully defied great powers. With great skill, I might add. Great pain. The defiance is a historical reality. The Middle East is littered with the remains of the ambitions and dreams of great powers who believe wrongly and impose their will on small tribes. But these three articles of faith, one, equitable and durable solution, two, brought to you only by negotiations, and three, with America driving the train, all of these propositions are today, in my judgment, seriously open to question. Now, I cannot abandon them because no one has the right to abandon the future. What do I tell my children? <coughs> that there can never be this or never be that? I mean, adults occupy a discrete period of time and physical space, and then we depart. No one has the right to abandon the future and mortgage it, because you don't know what will be. You have no moral authority to do it either. However, you do have the right and obligation and responsibility to abandon your illusions. That is the distinction that is worth making when it comes to the problem of what I call a much too promised land. Because we, I'll only speak about Americans now, have been engaged in a number of illusions over time, which have disappointed, frustrated, and ultimately are still very much at work now, which have prevented uh, our playing our own role. Not to mention, I might add, the illusions that the Arabs and the Israelis 
have and own in their own right. So, is Eric's <coughs> only peace possible <coughs> to the mutual satisfaction of both sides? Oh, yes, absolutely. The assumption, however, is that each side, including America, which ultimately will be a broker, must be willing to pay the price. And the problem, including April 26, 2010, is that nobody is willing to pay for this. You can blame all day long, but in the end, as Michael Jackson, that great lately departed philosopher once observed in a brilliant song called Man in the Mirror, I quote him in my book, if you want to make a change in your life, there's only one place to start. You don't start by looking anywhere else but beyond you. You look in the mirror and you determine what you are responsible for. Then and only then can you begin to make an accurate assessment and have the kind of authority and skill and will that is required to figure out what everybody else is responsible for. Because being in denial is something that we are very good at. Um, so, I would argue to you simply that there is far too little clarity and honesty in this debate on this issue. And since I'm no longer in the position where I need to sell anything to anybody or defend anything other than what I consider to be my assessment of reality, and I'm not here to sell you anything, I'm going to try to lay the basis for what I would argue to you is the necessary recipe for a successful negotiation drawn on some important past lessons, and then try to make an assessment in the time that remains about the future. Now, let me just say one other thing about history. I'm a trained historian, and I could count on one hand the number of times I used history in 25 years to argue, <laughs> debate, refute, or prove a point when I was presenting an argument to the President of the United States or a Secretary of State. That is scandalous. Because while history does not repeat, Mark Twain had it right, history rhymes. It rhymes. And it is the rhythmic patterns of those rhymes that is critical to see it was Faulkner who wrote in Requiem for a Nun that the past is never over. It's never even past. And if, if there's any area of the world where that is truer, it is here, where the past becomes a prison. So I would argue to you it's absolutely critical to look backwards. And without knowing where you've been, it's almost inconceivable to know where you're going. One tiny example, which led to a very big problem. We occupied, we the United States, occupied Japan for seven years, from 1945 to 1952. Seven years we occupied Japan. If I were to ask you, or anybody on this campus, how many Americans were killed in hostile actions by Japanese during that seven year period, on the Japanese mainland. Do you know what the answer is? Mm. None. Not one. Not five, or three, or two, or even one. None. Now, what, why, do, why do we even mention this? Well, what do you suppose we were thinking when we decided in the spring of 2003 to invade an occupant occupy a country roughly population-wise the size of the state of California, dismantle its institutions with insufficient force and an insufficient understanding of the nature and dynamics of Iraq's politics. What, what were we thinking? In wars of choice, discretionary wars, 
Great powers need to think things through. Because the question is not, <clears throat> and it includes peacemaking as well, the question is not, can America act and succeed? That may be the question. But the other question is, what will it cost? That's the question. What do things cost in life? And what is the price <coughs> of failure? I remember Bill Clinton after the second briefing before he we went to Camp David in July of 2000. And I write about it in the, in the foreign policy article. Saying to us, he said, guys, we have to go to Camp David because trying and failing is better than not having tried at all. I was very compelled by that. That's quintessentially American. It may be quintessentially human. Trying and failing is better than not having tried at all. That assumes that there is no cost or consequence that befalls the great power for failure. And that is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. As I would argue to you, our street cred is gone. The mystique of American power is gone. We haven't had a success in Arab Israeli negotiations since 1991. Since Jim Baker spent nine months trying to put together terms of reference for a three-day peace conference in Madrid, which produced no agreements, even though it was the first figurative table around which Arabs and Israelis, including Israelis and Palestinians, would sit since the Camp David process, 13 years ago. There is a cost for failure. <clears throat> and looking to the past, arguably, is, is extremely important. So, let me make three basic points about the past. Number one, and this should tell you something about our policy and the degree of difficulty of Arab Israeli peacemaking. In 60 years of being involved in this problem, America has had three successes. Three. Not five, not eight, three. Not the other one. The disengagement agreements, and some would even argue about whether they, they were successes themselves. The disengagement agreements, two with Egypt and Israel, one between Israel and Syria, 1973 to 1975. One peace treaty, March of 79, Carter, Saddam Bay, and one three day peace conference, and Madrid, October of 91. That's it. The Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty was negotiated by the Jordanians and the Israelis themselves. Oslo proved to be, even with American help, in the last stages of its life, a spectacular failure. Every other effort has not been consummated or has been structured in a way that success could never materialize. So the degree of difficulty in trying to do this is galactic. That's number one. Uh, number two, the reasons for our absence of success are shared both between those who live in the neighborhood and American policy. And there are, I would argue, three core reasons that have made it almost impossible for the Arabs and the Israelis and the Palestinians to reach agreements. One is the absence of leadership. There's no other way to say this. When there have been breakthroughs, they are a result of men who are masters of their political circumstances, not prisoners of their politics. Without that, you have nothing. Five men, again, we're responsible for most of the death, destruction, and misery, as well as the promise of security and prosperity from 1930 to 1950. Five human beings, just to give you a sense of how important leadership, how consequential leaders' actions can actually be, both for good and for ill. Without leadership, you have nothing. 
We are all conditioned to believe in our tiny lives, that we are hostage to impersonal forces beyond our control. It's a very powerful argument. And there's much to be said for it. But leaders are critical. And without boldness and a capacity to deliver their constituents, who must be unified, without, a, without the willingness to surrender to the leader who has legitimacy, some measure of moral authority, nothing can happen. That's one of the reasons it's been so critically important. In this part of the world, politics is existential. That's the other reality. Sadat, Rami. I watched Arafat and uh, Barack at Camp David sit in the same room where Sadat and Meg is. Now, what do you suppose is going through the minds? Certainly in Arafat. He made it very clear. Three times I heard him say, you will not walk behind my coffin. You will not walk behind my coffin. Whether Barack was thinking about Rabin, I don't know. But the notion that what I do today, I cannot sell tomorrow, and not selling it, not only fundamentally skews my place in history, undermines my street cred with my own constituency, and could cost me my life, is extremely consequential. Without leaders, almost nothing will happen. That is why the breakthroughs, when they came, Begin, Sadat, Hussein, Arafat, Rabin, and had it, had it been possible with Assad, the elder, all of those would have required leaders who have legitimacy and street cred. Second, urgency. Without urgency, you have nothing. Without, and I'll come back to this again, without the pain gain index somehow being altered to create urgency, why move? If in fact these are existential issues, if in fact they are so dangerous, lethal, politically devastating, what would prompt you to want to go into a process willingly or voluntarily? Vision? Morality? Ethics? No. The history of peacemaking in this region is not that. It is, again, men determining what they must do in an effort to advance national interests or what they might want to do or what they have to do. On the Israeli side, peacemaking is a story of transformed hawks. It is not about the left. It's not even about the center begging. You have an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty because Menachem Begin decided to trade Sinai for the West Bank. That is why you have peace between Egypt and Israel. Rabin concluded in the wake of the first Intifada, that Israel had no military solution to managing the Palestinian problem. Sharon disengaged from Gaza not because he had somehow, having been the master architect as Minister of Housing and Minister of Agriculture of the settlement enterprise, Sharon didn't suddenly determine that there, there was no ideological legitimacy to this enterprise in Gaza. He withdrew because he had other motives. And so it was with Benjamin Netanyahu in his first incarnation in 96 to 99. He said he would never sign an agreement with Arafat. He signed two. He said he would never withdraw from any West Bank territory. He was the first Likud prime minister. The first to withdraw a tiny sliver in an agreement which ultimately the Y River Memorandum, which was never fully implemented. Urgency, pressure, and the prospects of reward. These two things create urgency, which in turn allow leaders to act. And finally, the third piece of it, you need a project that doesn't exceed the carrying capacity of either side. The notion of a comprehensive peace 
between Israel and the Arab world in which you solve the Israeli-Syrian, Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Lebanese problems in one grand gesture, one triumph of hope over experience, it's an illusion. It's an illusion because it exceeds the carrying capacity of what leaders are capable of. And I haven't gotten to the Americans yet. So, leadership, urgency, the doable deal. That is what has allowed the breakthroughs that have occurred to occur. Finally, you need an effective mediator. And I would argue, and I'll be very clear about this, we have been effective as a mediator three times. Not quite coincidentally, the three times in which we have actually succeeded. You can argue with me all day long about the relevance, consequence, magnitude of these successes. I'm not here to proclaim the virtues of three disengagement agreements, one peace, three and a three day peace track. But that is the sum total of American success in the Arab Israeli arena. Each of those successes were possible because you had leadership, urgency, and a caring capacity that the two sides could accommodate out there, and because you had effective mediation. You had Kissinger, you had Carter, and you had James Baker, all of whom were prepared, particularly with these Israelis, to combine the right mixture of toughness and reassurance. It involved significant fights with the Israelis on every occasion, it involved confronting the pro-Israeli lobby and community in the United States. But every time that the willful president, advised by the skillful Secretary of State, defined an American interest, the Americans triumphed. And domestic politics always, always takes a back seat. Yes, the pro-Israeli community has a powerful voice in America. Anyone who's not doesn't grasp that point as being dishonest. But at the same time, the notion that somehow five and a half million American Jews, or for that matter, an additional 40 million evangelical Christians, somehow have a veto power over the contours of American foreign policy is equally deceptive, equally delusional. Israel's friends want to, want to persuade themselves that Value affinity drives the relationship and domestic politics are irrelevant. Israel's enemies want to persuade themselves that that's all there is other than domestic politics. If there were no domestic politics, there would be no U.S. Israel relationship. Both of those arguments are fundamentally flawed. Presidents lead, lobbies lobby. It's the nature of our system. And willful presidents poised to succeed, who know what they're doing, take on domestic political lobbies, they win. There's no precedent, other precedent, for losing. So, the four factors, very clear. Now, let's turn to today. Um, this president, whom I voted for, not because I know who he is, uh, I voted for him because his election represented the validation of a system, which is much more important than he is. No other democratic polity in the world, not the Brits, not the French, not the Germans, not the, certainly not the Israelis, could ever have elected a man whose wife is a direct descendant of slaves, a man of color, a man who is still despised by millions of his own citizens and made him the most powerful man on earth. Only in America as a consequence of the nature of our political system, could such a thing happen? Because our nationalism, unlike in many places, including here, is not ethnic, sectarian, or religious. Our nationalism <coughs> is political. Anybody can be an American. So Obama's election was quite extraordinary. Doesn't mean race is dead in America by a long shot. But it's quite a remarkable testament to American exceptionalism, at least within its own borders. 
And I might add, Sarah Palin and Barack Obama are both products of the same system. Because in, in America, there is a huge priority given to the privacy of the individual. It exists in myth, but it also exists in reality. We really do believe people count. Human beings actually count. We really do believe that they can accomplish extraordinary things, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter who their fathers and mothers were. This is quite extraordinary. But you have a potentially transformative president who, in my judgment, very well, wants a breakthrough on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on his watch, because he has persuaded himself that within four years, or eight, assuming he's a two-term president, there will be no more two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Maybe that's right. I suspect it probably is. Maybe not. The president has convinced himself. The problem is, he has a conundrum. He wants this. But the question is, can he produce it? That's the question. Are any of the three factors I identified, leadership, urgency, and a project that doesn't exceed the carrying capacity of the Arabs and the Israelis, let's even count the Israelis and the Syrians in this world, in addition to the Amalekites, in addition to the Israelis and the Palestinians? Is Mahmoud Abbas and Benjamin Netanyahu, or even Bashar Assad, a master of their respective political houses? Do they have the moral authority, the will, the skill, the legitimacy to make the kinds of decisions on issues that are perceived to be both identity-driven, like refugees in Jerusalem, and territorially and security-driven, like Jerusalem and security and borders? Where's the urgency? How bad is it really? Is there enough pain and enough prospects of gain? Why didn't events in December of 2008 and January of 2009 create the grounds for a breakthrough? There was plenty of pain, most of it visited on Palestinians in Gaza. Plenty of urgency, probably not. And finally, the project is a deal on the core issues that drive the conflict, and there are only four of them, borders, refugees, security, and Jerusalem, all other issues are subordinate to those four. Are the gaps between Israelis and Palestinians on those issues bridgeable? Well, this is what the president wants to try to determine. So his challenge is very simple. If I had my five minutes with the president, I would simply ask him the following question. Do you believe, Mr. President, that you can substitute your leadership, willfulness, and urgency for the absence of willfulness, urgency, and leadership that now exists in the Arab-Israeli arena? That is Barack Obama's question. That is his challenge. Now, I would argue, being an honest person, not one who wants to engage in additional illusionary thinking, which I did for many years when I believed. And if you read, the, if you read my article, The False Religion of Minnie's Peace, basically argues that the word religion comes from the Latin religiare, meaning to adhere or to bind. That's what religion is, whether it's secular religion or theological religion. It presents the adherent with a set of unbelievably compelling propositions which adhere, bind, and always obligate. It's very compelling. And in the world of the can-do, which is what, which is the world in which I lived for a better part of my life, there's much that is compelling. It just wasn't real. That's the problem. That's the question that, that the president needs to, to ask. Now, I will say to you, knowing almost nothing about what he's thinking, because I'm not even so sure, he, he knows that sometime between now and the year's end, he will test this proposition. He will test it by ultimately 
acceding to what he perceives to be the default position. Proximity talks will not succeed. Direct negotiations between the Arabs and the Israelis, should, I should keep saying between the Arabs and the Israelis, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, will not succeed. The default position for Obama in his transformational role is a US plan. Call them the Obama parameters. Call them the, the Obama initiative. Whatever you want to call them, you will see them. You will see them, I suspect, by the end of 2010. And his challenge on the substance will be the following. Can he reconcile the 67 issues, which primarily rotate around two or three issues, <laughs> Jerusalem, and borders and security. Can he reconcile the 67 issues with the 48 issues, which revolve around refugees, compensation, right of return, historic responsibility for the creation of the refugee problem, and on the Israeli side, recognition of Israel's Jewish identity. That is going to be his Herculean task in trying to create a substantive package that offers to Israelis and Palestinians to borrow the line from the Godfather, the deal, the offer that Israelis and Palestinians simply can't refuse. There is no deal Arabs and Israelis cannot refuse. There is no deal that they cannot say yes but to. There is no deal they cannot say no to. This is the other challenge that he will confront. The challenge of, are we a great power or not? Larry Summers, a guy who heads up the President's Council on Economic Advisors, once when we were at Davos together, we were taking a walk and he said to me, you know, Aaron, he said, it's a true story. He said, in the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car. So he's, he's in the history of the world, no one I've ever washed a rental car. I didn't know what to say. He's a very smart guy, former president of Harvard, youngest president, brilliant economist. So I walked away. He said, very interesting. And all of a sudden it hit me. Why don't you wash a rental car? It's the most important, it's the most important piece of philosophy you will hear today, I guarantee you. Why don't you wash a rental car? You don't wash your rental car because you care only about what you own. That's why. If Obama doesn't own this, and if the Arabs and the Israelis can't be induced, pressured, and or pressured to own it through prospects of pain and prospects of gain, it will not work. I've got 1,500 years. Middle Eastern history on my side. Barack Obama has 15 months on his. Let me close with one additional observation. I'm writing a new book, which has nothing, mercifully, thankfully, to do with the Arab Israeli issue or the Middle East at all, called Can America Have Another Great President? Question mark. It's a book about presidential greatness. What it means, how come it's been missing, and can it never come back? The first and last president who ever had an emotional impact on me was Jack Kennedy. I was 12 when he was assassinated. Everybody in my generation can tell you where they were when Jack Kennedy was, when they heard Jack Kennedy was killed. Kennedy said something about himself that is very, very <coughs> right. And I would impart it to you. It, it helps me, whether it helps you or not, I don't know. Kennedy described himself as an idealist without illusion. Idealism without illusion. That is the appropriate way, I would argue to you, to approach this conflict and just about anything else in your life that is hard. Because idealism without illusion allows you never to give up on the prospects of actually changing something but it impels you and forces you to go through the process of that change with your eyes 
wide open. Thank you very much. First thing is, Deb, I feel like you're familiar with this in your travels around the Middle East. When you say something like, only in America for Barack Obama, it's, it's, it's difficult as an American to hear that sort of thing, because I can come up with millions of examples of leaders around the world that have actually lived up to that criteria. But what I'm wondering is something different. Is something that I feel like you don't actually address, even in the long article that just came out that you put, which is the role of the resistance axis in the whole peace process. So what I'm wondering is, what you're saying is sort of, you know, there's got to be pain and then a way towards gain. And I'm wondering, what role do you think the resistance axis is playing in creating that pain that could then lead to some sort of a solution? I'm wondering, maybe that's something that's under-theorized. Maybe that's something that's under-theorized right now, especially among American foreign policy folks who will give a long speech and not even mention Hamas, not mention Hezbollah, etc. And I'm just wondering if maybe those forces are actually finally, of themselves, forcing themselves into the peace process. How do you, how do you see that? Is there, is there any way that we can think positively about that? Is there any way to avoid violence in that? Is that, is that an inevitable dynamic? So your thoughts so on when that? When you say we, I mean, the, real, the reality is that no American not this one for sure, is going to get creative when it comes to trying to play the prospects of inter-inter-Palestinian politics. I mean, you, you have right now, you have right now a fundamental problem which revolves around the absence of a monopoly over the forces of violence within Palestinian society. That problem, and I'm not here to moralize or editorialize about why it exists, it's really not even relevant. From the standpoint of the power, unless you have one gun, one voice, one negotiating position, one authority, the prospects of using that to induce the Israelis to make the kinds of moves that are required, the chances of that happening are slim to, slim to none, number one. Number two, however legitimate Hamas may be as a force within Palestinian politics, the United States has never been comfortable it chooses, as you know, its own movements of national liberation to sponsor. Great powers can be exceedingly and purposefully and willfully hypocritical. They choose to accept certain standards and to deny others. That's what great powers do. They may not do it effectively. It may not be ethical or moral or moral. The, the, the task here is, rec is reconciling morality on one hand with history and politics on the other. I'm not so sure the end of that process is going to be very satisfying. So I don't think the prospects of uh, America acknowledging Hamas's legitimacy, relating to it through cutouts or directly, is, has much of a chance in the, in the current environment of, of succeeding. And I think it does pose a huge problem, huge. Other than the actions that the Israelis take consequence of their role as occupiers. The single greatest problem confronting a serious negotiation leading, and again, let me choose my words very carefully here. I did not, I did not introduce this point, but I want to introduce it. I am saying to you that the prospects of a, con and I do not want to be misquoted on this, the prospects of a conflict ending agreement between the current Palestinian Authority and the current government of Israel is not possible. Conflict ending, four core issues, Jerusalem, security, borders, and refugees. Outcome, Israeli prime minister stands up before the people of Israel, Palestinian president stands up before the Palestine Legislative Council and says the following. It may take a generation to create the kinds of reconciliation that is necessary. But as of this day, our conflict with you has ended. There is no more irredenta. There are no more claims. There is nothing more to be resolved or adjudicated. What I'm suggesting to you is that that outcome is simply not possible in this world. If you want to continue to go on and believe that it is, that's fine. Maybe I'll be wrong. That would not just be fine, that would be wonderful. I don't think so. 
I don't think so. The fact that you have a dysfunctional, deeply divided Palestinian national movement, which 50 years after its inception has not yet coalesced in a meaningful way around a strategy that pervades Palestinian ranks to achieve Palestinian national aspirations is a huge problem because there is no leverage to be used with Israel without that. Because if I were an Israeli prime minister, I live in Chevy Chase, Maryland, okay? Right on the Maryland district line. Do you know what the, do you know what the criterion for serious polities are, whether they're authoritarian or democratic? Mm -hmm. Control over all of the guns. And I'm not suggesting America has control over all of the guns, but we do not have separate militias and organizations with separate security services, separate political agendas, separate patrons, separate sources of funding, separate ideologies. That problem, and maybe it's a sequential problem, maybe it's a sequential problem. The administration's view of fixing the Hamas problem is borrowed from Kevin Costner's starring role in Field of Dreams. <laughs> Build it, film it, come. and they will come. You create the deal so compelling, so sweet for Palestinians on the four core issues that public opinion and elite opinion will like, like moss to a flame the moon's impact over, over the oceans. There will be a relationship which will ultimately draw Palestinian public opinion around the good Palestinians to the good Palestinians against the not so good Palestinians. That's the vision, that's the conceit of what is supposed to happen. It's arguably logical, but it, it it's not real. It's not real. I don't have a problem to fix what I would gently describe to you, and not in a facetious, malicious way, as the, what I call the Palestinian Humpty Dumpty. I do not have a pro, uh, an answer to that. Just like I don't have an answer with respect to Iran's uh, willful decision to cross the at some point cross the nuclear threshold. I don't have I don't have an answer to that either. But without one, with respect to Hamas, I don't see where this goes. Because in the end, the Israeli Prime Minister will say the following: Sure, I'm willing to make these existential concessions to Mahmoud Abbas when you can tell me and show me that he controls and is prepared to silence all of the guns of Palestine. Until that day, we can put it in escrow, you can have all of it, I'll put it down for you, you can put it in your bank account, you can lock it up in a box. I'll give it to you, President Obama, but there will be no implementation of any of it. And that problem is huge. Because you have two non-state actors, Hamas and Hezbollah, operating effectively in two non-states, which have developed through your notion of, of the resistance access, an ideologically attractive alternative with the means to do something about it. And I don't know how to deal with that. We're not we, we, we're not creative. Americans are not creative when it comes to these matters. Yes, we can deal with the uh, awakening of Iraq. We can even negotiate with the Taliban. We will choose which movements, violent, even those who have engaged in terror against America. See, people ask me all the time, well, you deal with the awakening. You deal with Taliban. You're probably even dealing with Al-Qaeda cutouts. How come you can't deal with Hamas, it's got to be the pro-Israeli lobby again. The answer is, in the context of the battlefield, 
in which American forces are deployed and American lives are exposed, we'll do just about anything. We'll make all kinds of deals with the devil if necessary. This isn't one of those situations. We have discretion here. We know how politically damaging and risky it would be. We also know that opening a dialogue with Hamas right now is the key to an empty room. If we were on the verge of signing an agreement, if we were on the verge of delivering Israeli concessions, and all that remained was the absence of a U.S. dialogue with Hamas, that's another story. That's a strategy. That's something that actually might work. But opening a dialogue because we want to talk, because we want to know, because we want a relationship, no. It ain't going to happen. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm a blogger. I won't sort of present. Uh, quick question. In what way does U.S. complicity in the siege and collective punishment of people in Gaza uh, enhance American interests, since that's what we're concerned about here? Uh, also, will you talk about General Keith Dayton's role in orchestrating the coup in 2006, the Fatah coup? And finally, do you support Palestinian Israeli civil rights in Israel? And how does that uh, impact the Jewish state? It doesn't. That's my question. That's my answer to your first question. I don't know anything about Keith Dayton. I know Keith Dayton, but I don't know anything about his rule, his purported rule in 2006. On the issue of Israeli Arabs, I think there's a Palestinian citizen of Israel. I think you have a serious problem here in Israel. Serious problem. Because right now, how can, I, how can I describe this? In the 50s, 1950s, America was a preferential democracy. Can't compare the two problems. Well, actually, if you looked at America 62 years after independence, roughly 1838, and you took a look at what America was and what America is today, and by the way, back to your question, when we're done in that, I really would like to know all the millions of consequential countries that have minorities, as people of color, as democratic politics, uh, in positions of that kind of power and leadership. I submit to you that Napoleon was a Corsican, Stalin was a Georgian, Disraeli was a Jew, maybe you could argue that, but there are no other examples, not on the, not on the level of the great power, or even the near great power. And I would call women, by the way, although the world is a lot farther ahead, even the Muslim world, when it comes to women as presidents and prime ministers than America is. But on the issue of preferential democracy, there's a real problem. In 1838, blacks were slaves, women were completely disenfranchised, only white property males could vote. So the notion that democratic polities can evolve over time is and a, a historical, they can. Israelis have a significant problem now, because in many ways they are a prefer I got a huge screaming match with my daughter on this issue. She kept trying to persuade me, and she eventually did, that Israel was in fact a preferential democracy. Now there may be other democratic polities that are preferential democracies as well. France may be a, a, a preferential democracy. That is to say, um, or may, maybe not, in law, Israeli Arabs can vote, but the degree of discrimination on matters of social and economic resources is structural. Not to mention the public square. I, I used to head up an organization called Seeds of Peace, which brought young Indians and Pakistanis, Israelis and Palestinians to the United States for conflict resolution training. And we got, the delegations were chosen by the respective governments, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Yemen, Tunisia, Morocco, Israel. 20% of the Israeli delegation were Palestinian citizens of Israel. 20%, which reflects essentially the democratic, democratic policy. Beginning of each session, they'd have a flag raising ceremony. Each delegation would stand. They would raise the flags of their respective nations, and they'd sing the national anthem. Now, <coughs> you're, you're an Israeli Arab, Palestinian citizen of Israel. You got three choices. 
when when the uh, when Hatikva, the national anthem of the state of Israel, is played and the Israeli flag is raised. You've got three choices. Remember, the delegation leader, who is a, a, a official of the Israeli Ministry of Education, is an Israeli an Israeli Jew, is watching. You have three choices. Choice number one is you sing Hatikva. You can't do that for obvious reasons. Number two is you don't sing. Well, if you don't sing, you show arguably disrespect. Number three, you sing the Palestinian national anthem when they play as they did um, and raise the Palestinian national flag for the West Bankers and Gazans. That's what most of these kids did. But can you imagine the identity? And I watched and tried to intercede when Israeli delegation we're screaming at these kids. There's no public square in Israel which would allow a Palestinian citizen of Israel to participate because Israeli nationalism is defined ethnically and religiously. It's not defined politically. That problem is going to continue in addition to the other Palestinian problem, the one that exists in Jerusalem and Gaza and the West Bank. It's Israel's other Palestinian problem, is going to continue to pose tremendous challenges over time. Sorry, just to clarify, you don't think that the collective punishment that Palestinians and Gaza impacts American moral credibility in the region? No, you asked me whether I thought it served American interests. No, 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 no. And I answered that I misunderstood. It doesn't serve American interests. Okay. I mean... Can I ask a quick question? I just spent a couple of months coming and going in the United States, which was particularly pleasant because it was during the college basketball championship season. So that um, wanted a little bit of the other stuff that I was witnessing. But one of the fascinating things was that it seems for the first time, certainly, and I'm 61 like you are in our lifetimes, there seems to be a, a real debate among the administration in Washington about precisely the points you're talking about. What should Obama and his team do vis-a-vis -vis trying to help resolve the Arab-Israeli conflicts? And I heard some people who told me that they, people who are, who are insiders and involved in this, that they can classify them three groups. The people, the Dennis Ross group, that is particularly sensitive to keeping the Israelis on board and dealing with them. The George Mitchell group that is particularly focused on just get the negotiations started, forget everything else, get them in the room, let's start the talks. And the Jim Jones uh, group that is saying American national interest is the critical thing. We need to push both sides and get, uh, get our views out there. Um, first of all, is there a real debate going on in Washington? And if so, is this a significant moment? You know, I think that that um, in any administration, I've worked for five, there are significant differences that exist uh, in agencies and between agencies, particularly on an issue like this. Um, that is, the, the notion that there are different views expressed isn't what concerns me, because under ideal circumstances, and they were ideal when we looked for Jim Baker, who allowed this kind of dissent and encouraged it, and it was a, who, who was determined to exercise adult supervision, it worked. What concerns me is the absence of adult supervision. You, you ultimately need the president, and I would even argue the secretary of state, to impose the kind of discipline which filters through all the conflicting advice and then comes out with the policy. And my concern is, after watching them for 15 months, I don't think that discipline has yet been imposed. Part of it has to do with the fact that they really don't know what to do. I mean, I realize that that may shatter any stereotypes that uh, you have about American policy, but watching eight years of Bill Clinton in eight years of George W. Bush in Middle East war making and Middle East peacemaking would bring any reasonable person to the conclusion that more often than not, things have not been going to happen. 
So uh, I, my, my hidden agenda here is to avoid another failure because I see another one coming. Um, in the back, Johnny, and then the front of the front. And then up here. Um, in your book, uh, The Too Much Palestine, you, you quoted Hana Ashrawi, the Palestinian um, thinker and diplomat, etc., uh, saying that uh, the Americans tend to give, and I'm paraphrasing here, the Americans tend to give the Israelis uh, all of the carrots and the Palestinians all of the sticks. And I think you agree, if I remember correctly. And um, what, how has that hindered Arab-Israeli uh, peace negotiations, especially from the American perspective? Well, I think it's, it's, it's hindered it greatly. I mean, I, I once made the claim, um, well, I once got myself into big trouble. I interviewed all of our presidents for my last book, except one, Bill Clinton, a man who I admire and respect, because he wouldn't, he wouldn't see me. There was someone around him who was so angry at something I had written that he wouldn't see me. I, I wrote an article in the Washington Post. It's been five years already. People should just forget about it already. Called Israel's lawyer, in which I argue that too many American officials, and I use the parenthetical, including myself, too often function as an attorney for Israel, losing sight of the fact that the real client in the mediator's world is the agreement. That's the client. You become advocates, essentially, for both parties toward your ultimate client, which is the agreement. Too often we didn't do that. And we have um, lost, eight years under Bill Clinton, eight years under George W. Bush, our capacity to be independent when it comes to our positions in negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis. Now, I believe, and there is a compelling concept in negotiation theory, called the paradox of the partial mediator. Paradox of the partial mediator. I like this concept, because what it argues, basically, is what you want if you're in a mediation. You want somebody who's got enormous influence with one of the parties, maybe even closer relations than that person has with you, because only the partial mediator can deliver if the partial mediator keeps in mind the core requirements of the other side, all sides. So I think what's happened uh, is that our special relationship with the Israelis, which I might add exists independent of any of our Middle East interests, which is something that people still will not refuse to grasp. The they consider it and then they throw it away. How can you have a relationship with Israel that has nothing to do with your interests? It comes from a profound misunderstanding of how America relates to the world. That special relationship has gone exclusive. That's the problem with our policy. It's not that we're too close to Israel. It's that we don't know how to use the proximity to our own advantage. We've surrendered the special to the exclusive. Kissinger, Carter, and Baker, they got the right balance. Clinton and Bush 43? No. And I work for both of them. I don't say this. I mean, I, Bill Clinton was, no one cared more, tried to do more about this problem than Bill Clinton. But he just wasn't tough enough. And he wasn't prepared to um, Camp David summit. I mean, it came to an end on the fourth day. I knew it was over. It was a 13-day summit. It came to an end on the fourth day, because on the fourth day, it sounds like something up in the bottom. On the fourth day, <laughs> we presented to the Israelis what we, what we called an IMP paper, an Israeli and Palestinian paper, which had on the core issues bracketed language about possible, possible bridging proposals. <clears throat> Barack saw the paper, hated it, hated it. 
and sent it back. And instead of saying to the Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, okay, you don't like this? Well, let's go through this. One by one, you tell me your objections. We'll determine whether or not they are credible and meaningful. We'll try to work with you. By the way, we gave the paper to these ladies first, which is a common, a common, um, along the no surprise policies, that the policy we have with the Israelis. So we got back from Barack, and he, had, he actually made a few suggestions. We gave it to Arafat, he hated it too. And Bill Clinton, on day four, got two no's from the small tribes to the great power. And the no's were given with no cost and no consequence. And on day four, Camp David Summit came to an end because if the small power can do that, when the big power is supposed to be in charge, you can't negotiate that way. We'd have been at Camp David for a year and still not accomplished anything. Carter, and this is part of our problem because we recommended to the president, you have to go. I remember the briefing. There were 12 people. They all stood up and said the same thing. You got to go, Mr. Pr Mr. President, because if you don't go, there'll be violence. There was. If you don't go, you'll be accused of not caring about an issue that you had invested so much in. You have to go. Well, it was not. We were thinking clearly. Barack wasn't ready. He might have been more ready in terms of advancing positions that Israel had never put on the table, but they were nowhere near what would have been necessary to end the conflict. Arafat didn't come to Camp David to reach an agreement, he came to survive. And Bill Clinton wasn't ready either. He wouldn't take charge. That summit never should have happened. Next, uh, someone there, and then just you. Uh, hi, um, my name is Josh Hirsch. I'm a freelance journalist here. Uh, I'm sorry if my question overlaps with Nick's a little bit, kind of feeds off of the answer you gave, but you said that realistically there's no chance that the United States is going to open that door with Hamas. That's not going to happen right now. Maybe domestically, politically, it's impossible, uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense. But I wonder if you if you feel, I'm mean, just to understand what you're saying, I mean, do you, do you not feel like it's essential for that to happen? I mean, do you think that peace is possible without that kind of step happening? Um, something that, you know, Jimmy Carter has been pushing for a lot now. Uh, and here in America, the, I mean, here in Lebanon, the American diplomats aren't allowed to speak with Hezbollah. Something that I know is, is that they express to me when I talk to them is a great disservice to them. Sometimes they ask me, like, what my interviews are like with them, you know, what they're like. Uh, do, do you feel like that's a big impediment to what's happening here? First of all, you know, I, I no more want the State Department to be running on policy than I do APEC. I mean, we, people are prisoners of their respective cultures, all right? But nobody commands the whole except the president. Nobody commands the whole except the president. So however frustrated my former colleagues may be with their inability to talk to him, all of the pieces of the puzzle need to be assembled in a strategy. If we had a strategy that actually showed promise of working, I'd be prepared to risk quite a lot. I just don't see it. And I refuse to consider it piecemeal because I know it won't work. I know it will not work. I do not see how a two-state solution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can ever be reached without Palestinian Israel. That is my fundamental point of departure. Now, I'm told by Palestinians, by members of the Palestinian Authority, that that's crazy. That Palestinian unity is no longer possible on any meaningful basis. Tactical, perhaps, yes. But, but we, Fatah, or at least those elements who control the Palestinian Authority, will not reconcile in any meaningful way. Because Hamas is off on a completely different track. Is it right? Is it wrong? I don't know. All I know is it's dysfunction. You cannot have two polities separated in, in, in um, geographic terms with two separate sets of security agencies, two separate sets of economies, even though the Palestinian Authority is paying 
is paying the salaries of scores of thousands of Palestinian um, authority officials in Gaza, which is a huge boom to a very depressed and devastated economy. Two different sets of patrons, two different sources of funding, two different constitutions, two different ideologies. How can you manage a national movement like this? The FLN, the Viet Cong, this is not how movements of national liberation succeed. You can't succeed. Because if you can't mend your own internal house, how do you ever apply the necessary strategy toward your adversary? How can you do this? Well, the answer is you can't. We cannot fix the problem of Palestinian internal unity. We cannot and we will not any more than we can somehow mend the dysfunction, which is more organized, but still dysfunction, that exists within the Israeli polity. One last point, and please don't take this the wrong way. There is a view in this region. It's been there when I first got here, and it's still alive and well, that somehow, and I understand my country's responsibility for the devastation and destruction that has gone on here. And I'm prepared to own up for, to a lot of it. But we cannot save you. And we don't have the capacity. I'm not even sure we have the interest. We have a dysfunctional political system. We have an unemployment rate, which is un-American. We have a deficit that is going to make it impossible for the world's greatest borrower to be the world's greatest power. We have an angry political climate. Now, all this is relative. So the notion that somehow, and I, I give you Iraq and Afghanistan as two exhibits in what we cannot do Victory in these two places for America is now measured not by can we win, but when can we leave? When can we leave? Don't look to us to fix these problems, even while we bear responsibility for doing them. And as unethical, immoral, and otherworldly as my response may appear to you, it is what it is. So, I, and the Lebanese have been peculiarly affected by it for as long as I've interacted with them. To some degree, this is a culture of conspiracy and denial and an unwillingness to assume responsibility <coughs> for what I am responsible for. It's the Michael Jackson thing all <laughs> over again. How many years of colonial legacy of dysfunctional, extractive Arab regimes, of minorities, disturbingly large minorities within Islam who are willing to propagate in the name of religion, all kinds of things. I mean, when does this become my fault if I live here? It may not be any of your faults, but when is it a regional problem and how much of it does the great power, is the great power responsible? I, I ask these questions, and not out of disrespect, and not in an effort to be insensitive. Life is not easy, but I, I, I can't help see what I see. Yes, sir. Well, you might not be able to help or uh, solve these problems, but it certainly seems like you've done a great job of breaking them, breaking these policies. Like, let's look at the division within the Palestinian community. Um, it happened first because Hamas won the election and the Western powers boycotted their, their government, which was even a national unity government. And then it went beyond that, and like Ahmed said, it's been well documented that there was a coup attempt and Hamas had taken, take out, ended up in power in Gaza. And then there's a siege of Gaza, and you're not doing anything to break it, not you, but the United States who we used to work for, and it might be, seems awfully convenient for you to come here after working 
in the State Department for 25 years and just renounce all these failed strategies that we propagated. And that, yes, the Oslo Agreement was a failure, and it is increased colonization and imprisonment of the Palestinian people. So it seems like you have some illusions of your own about what, about what American nationalism or power is about. It's not, it doesn't have a love for people. That's basically what you just said here, is that it doesn't care. They don't care about the people of the region to, to make things better. Of course they don't, because they don't care about people. So I don't even know what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there may be a question that may not be. I, I don't, I'm not sure it, it, it boils down to that. I mean, governing is about choosing. That's what it means to govern. President make, presidents make decisions based on their priorities. I, I'm just suggesting to you, you may find it hypocritical. I, I don't find it hypocritical at all. I mean, people do things. They understand what they do. They change. They change in response to circumstances. I mean, I'm not a declinist. I just hope that America will be a lot smarter in the way it deals with this particular region because I think we are in an investment trap here. I do not believe we can fix this place. And I do not believe we can run away from it. And as a consequence of that, we may continue to do bad things. Or there may be unintended consequences of our action. Or we may not, in your view, be willing to do enough to redress what we've done. There are many different things that we're responsible for at many different levels. So I'm not, and I, what I'm not predicting to you is the, is the sort of transformative change in American behavior. You're not gonna see it. It's not gonna come, in my view. We're not going to sanction the Israelis. We're not gonna break the siege of Gaza by sanctioning the Israelis and creating so much pain for them that somehow they'll have no choice but to behave or to comply. It's just not the way the system works. And that's part of the problem. There's an inability. I mean, I'm, you know, like I said, life's about reconciling a lot of things that are sometimes not reconciled. History, politics, morality, ethics. I don't know if they all go together. Well, I'm pretty sure they don't go together. So you're never going to be happy with what we do. There's not a chance. The nature of our system, from your perspective, is profoundly flawed. The founders created a system which was an open invitation to struggle. They made it possible for checks and balances and lobbies and interest groups to have tremendous influence. And American policy is essentially not devised by three people. It's a essentially res a systemic response. That's why we can produce George W. Bush in one election and Barack Obama in the other. Doesn't that seem a bit odd to you? How can a country do that? They're not that different. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think even in a the bottoms of <laughs> just, just a hair by saying that. But I'll, I'll let your colleagues be A um, couple more questions. Make them short. We'll get short answers. Um, Nora was standing in the back. And Nora was standing. How are you? Bert, and then the two ladies over there. Um, I appreciate all the points you made about uh, people of the region having to take ownership of their own problems and their own frustrations. Do you think that it would be unrealistic, though, of the US, and this is not the whole process, uh, to do something or sanction the Israelis on the, on the issue of the settlements? It does create a lot of anger everywhere. Uh, and it is seen as an encroachment beyond uh, problems of existence and demographics, since there is a lot of free land inside Israel that's not really inhabited. What's, what's your sense of that? You know, fight, fighting with the Israelis is a, an occupational reality for serious peacemaking. Uh, in the three cases I've identified, the only three in which we've ever succeeded, 
uh, Kissinger, Carter, and Baker, they all fought with the Israelis. And in fact, in the Baker case, there was sanctions. Well, there were housing loan guarantees. It wasn't the Camp David entitlement, but it was fair, fair, you know, Israelis wanted $10 billion in housing loan guarantees, which would allow them to buy our, our using American credits at reduced rates in commercial banks. And Baker said no. And Shamir said yes. And ABEC said, we'll force you. And Baker won. It was two months before Madrid, which is exactly my point. Fighting with the Israelis is inevitable, but it has to be worthwhile. In other words, the fight has to produce something that makes an American president in our system and makes the Arab-Israeli negotiation actually better. Taking on the Israelis piecemeal isn't going to work. Because it's not part of a broader strategy, and frankly, it's not sustainable. You saw what happened in the last 15 months. In 09, Obama said comprehensive settlement groups, including natural growth. And, his, and Netanyahu said no. And Obama said okay. In 2010, in an incomprehensible move, in the middle of Joe Biden's visit, the Prime Minister, and went through this 45 minute plus lecture. And it continued after that. But four or five weeks later, guess what? It's make nice again. Because the policy just isn't sustainable. It's not sustainable for a busy president who has many other things to do. It's not sustainable because you, you do have midterms in 2010. And while most Jews are going to vote Democratic, you don't want to give the Republicans any additional issues to raise money against their Democratic candidates. And finally, Obama wakes up in the morning when he's shaving, or after he <laughs> says goodbye to the kids, and he thinks to himself, oh God, you know, I'm fighting with the Israelis. This is OK. It felt good for the first three or four days, but now what? I'm, I'm serious. Now what do I do? How, how do I succeed? How do we get back to the negotiations? How do we get in a position where, not on settlements, but on a peace plan, I might be able to challenge the Prime Minister of Israel on something that really not only counts, but could it, not that settlements don't, but is the much broader game. Because if I can take care of the border issue, if I can get June 67 borders, with modifications and one-to-one -one territorial swaps, I can deal with the settlements issue. Because we'll know where the border is. The Palestinians and Israelis will determine whether it's 2% the Israelis are going to keep or whether it's 5%. And the Israelis will then compensate the Palestinian Authority in swaps of equal size and value for the remainder, for the 4, 5, 6% that the Israelis intend to keep of the West Bank. Now that's something Obama's still talking to himself. It makes sense to me. But I'm not going to sustain this fight with these Israelis on settlement. It's felt good for the first three days. I get a lot of good press. Even in the Jewish community, things are running my way. But it doesn't go anywhere. Because over time, the Republicans and everyone else start to ask, well, what about negotiations? What about the idea of a two-state solution? I mean, you're still, you're still fighting with Netanyahu. It's 15 months already. And then you got midterms. And then you'll be into the third year. And then you got 2012. No. It feels good. It makes a lot of people feel good. But in the end, it doesn't go anywhere. It has no legs. What would be the consequence Perhaps you can surmise of uh, the USA walking away from the whole process. The James Baker, you have our phone number, call us when you're ready. Right. I think some people would like it and some people would be horrified by it. I think that um, given our investment out here, two wars, possibility of now we're running the prospects of serious sanctions and maybe more against Iran. Uh, the absence of credibility, a president who has the Nobel Peace Prize, who came out louder, harder, and faster than any of his predecessors on this issue. Every time I turn around, there's another Obama statement about the Palestinian issue. I mean, people are, if he did that, people, 
people, even the Republicans, who don't believe in this, would use it against him. So now, walking away, and I, you know, Jim Baker was the most effective negotiator I ever before. But that, that phone number was given at a very specific time to make a very specific point. And Baker was really angry that day. In fact, I asked him, or actually, Scowcroft asked me, how come Baker didn't give him the State Department? Why didn't he give me a White House? So I asked Baker about this, and he said to me, one of the greatest incomprehensible, you know, <laughs> Lapses of credibility. Say, hey, I didn't know the state department. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can add to that question, it's also in view of what Obama and Petraeus have publicly now said that solving this problem, this conflict, is in the strategic national interest of the United States. Is that a qualitative new level that the U.S. has moved to that has significance, or is this just some passing? Well, early spring. You know, if you want to get all dressed up for the party, and, and if you want to get all dressed up for the party, and you want to really be looking good, if you want to go out, and then all of a sudden, you, you're not going to go. But people are saying to you, you you've, now, you've now made Arab Israeli peace the single most important interest that America has. Okay? The analogy is someone who's diagnosed with a very serious illness. And you're trying to ameliorate it with that. That's, that's what That's what we do. We are not talking ourselves into another bad talking. Because the more we hype the fact that this is in our strategic interest, the more pressure we're placing on ourselves to do something. And the more disappointment there will be when we don't. That's, that's the real problem. <coughs> is it the most, I mean, it's the core issue in the Arab Israeli conflict. It's an issue which resonates with a, with a fervor and anger and an ideological and political resonance out here more than any other issue in a divided, dysfunctional Arab world. That alone serves as a basis of unity, so it's extremely meaningful. Is it more important to Americans than the fact that we've got hundreds of thousands of men and women deployed in wars we can't win? Or alternatively, is it more important to a to a perfect storm of uh, forces which, which is gathering in Pakistan? Or is it more important than uh, the, the possibility that, that the Israelis, because no Israeli prime minister will allow Iran to cross the nuclear threshold on his watch without cost or consequence, can act? Or is it more important than the fact that Obama may at some point decide he can't allow the Iranians and we initiate the interaction. Is it more important than all those things? The two ladies there? Or the one lady? Yeah. Um, my question is almost exactly the same as yours. I'm glad that you asked it. Um, but developing on that, the line of logic is not just that it's a major national security concern for the Americans. It's that our troops are dying because of this conflict because it's being used as ammunition against Americans. It's fueling extremism and, and hatred of, of Americans, and it's actually costing American lives. And you had said earlier, once that starts happening, we will do anything. So don't you think it's possible that this line of, of logic, because there is a good amount of evidence to suggest that there is this correlation between Americans being killed and this Israeli-Palestinian conflict, could that be enough to prompt serious action? No, I, I don't. I, I think not because because I'm not sure that the that the linkage in this case, if pushed to defend the linkage, if Petraeus was pushed to defend the linkage that Americans are dying as a consequence of an unresolved Palestinian issue, he'd really be hard pressed to do it. And first of all, you know, I had grave misgivings about the president's decision to deploy an additional thirty thousand Americans to Afghanistan. That's Forget what, it, forget what it would cost, which is a million dollars per man, per woman, per year. That's $30 million in 2010 for additional 30,000. Americans are dying in Iraq and Afghanistan for one reason. And you know what it is. We're deployed. That's why they're dying. We're there. Now, we can argue all day long about whether we should be there or what is the, the best means. But as far as I'm concerned, we need to extricate ourselves as quickly 
from these places as we possibly can. I don't think that it is logical, and the sources of anger against America in this region run very deep, very, very deep. Certainly, our seemingly blind support for the state of Israel is one of them. But there are also others. There's also our support for autocratic, extractive, and authoritarian Arab regimes, our lack of respect uh, or capacity to, to basically move these systems, to greater respect for human rights and pluralism. Um, there's the way we are, who we are, that we're big and we're powerful, and we're still in the despised. I, I fear by a disturbingly large minority, but a disturbingly large minority, who, as the former president said, they hate us because we love freedom. Well, if they hate us, they hate us partially because of what we do, not just because of who we are. But there are those who hate us because of who we are. Um, I think it's incumbent on, on any president to reduce the pool of anger and rage against America. And I write in the last chapter of my book that it would be unconscionable for any American president to ignore any source of rage. The Arab-Israeli conflict is one of those sources. I'm not suggesting that he ignore it, but here's the problem. If I believe, if I had my five minutes, and I believed that we could actually resolve this, I might have a different message for you here. But I cannot willfully, and will not anymore, since I've made too many bad decisions over too long a period of time, and gave too many bad pieces of advice to very important people who could actually do something about things because I believed. It wasn't bad that I believed. It was just wrong. Presidents are busy people. This guy's got a lot to do. I don't want to see him fail. I do not want to see an Obama plan on the table, which like Jimmy Carter and the hostage crisis, you're all too young, most of you, too young to remember this. But you know what the networks did? Beginning with the first day of that hostage deal, they listed every single day that Americans were held hostage in Iran, day 20, day 30, day 220, right up until the end. I don't want that to be the fate of the Obama plan. And right now, if the president said, Aaron, should I put out my plan? I said, Mr. President, if there is a reason, other than the fact that you, you don't care if it's accepted or not, and you're prepared to wait to create a sense of pressure, maybe, then put it out. But if you expect it to be accepted, don't do this. Because you're going to look weak. Because every day that goes by, with the tiny powers, plural, say no to you, you're going to look weak. I can't, in all good conscience, advise the president to do that. So that's why I'm very wary of hyping the no this notion, because we can't deliver. Uh, one last question. I think he had his hand up. No, he had the fellow with the beard. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'll go straight to about the mic. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot the okay. Yes, I had one question about America's role as both a mediator and the number one supporter and supplier of arms and financial aid to Israel that fuel this conflict at the same time. So how does it reconcile those two roles? And it's clearly that, you know, as a mediator is ineffective, so why play, why play both? Well, the problem is the, the campaign in time, which is the basis of the billions we provided to Israel and Egypt came out of our role as a mediator. Saddam wanted advanced military equipment, so did the Israelis. In addition to economic aid, they got it. One of the roles of the mediator, or I forget the mediator, one of the roles of America is to provide what I call off-the-table benefits, which have nothing to do with the negotiation, which are designed to reassure, act as incentives. And in this region, you know, I'm not a described to the merchant death school. But in this region, we have friends, allies. We maintain our influence, in part, as a consequence of the weapons we provide. <coughs> I mean, 
after all, and this is unprecedented, we are on the ground occupying two Muslim countries and maybe even threatening to do bad things against a third. It's remarkable, it's a remarkable time. So the notion of the notion of providing military equipment is just more normal. It's like breathing. It's more normal, more regular. We're getting more accustomed to it. Our friends and enemies are getting more accustomed to it. But that doesn't answer my question. So how can we be the mediator? How do you reconcile them? Well, we reconcile them by the fact that part of the part of the way look, if the Israeli Palestinian deal should happen, we're not going to pay for it. But we will definitely have to coordinate with billions, not only to take um, care of the Palestinian refugee issue, but the security issues which will have to be dealt with, including the deployment. I'm sure, of a NATO force led by the United States in the West Bank along the Jordan River, probably for 50 years, which was discussed actively in Camp David. You're going to see more militarization in an effort to get, it's a paradox, you're going to see more militarization in an effort to produce peace through the combination of an Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Syrian agreement than you've ever seen before. And frankly, one of my favorite authors, I know this, this may seem completely off the track, one of my favorite authors is F. Scott Fitzgerald. You know what, 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 what uh, Fitzgerald said? He said that the mark, the mark of the truly sophisticated mind is the capacity to reconcile the yes and the no. <coughs> now, I, to, me, the, to me, your question makes perfect sense, but so does my answer. So does my answer. I'm not even sophisticated yet, I apologize. No, it's sophisticated. It's sophisticated enough, I think. <laughs> Vulnerabilities and assurances in the region, in the neighborhood, will be a critically important part of any American commitment, particularly with respect to the Israelis. That will mean, without a doubt, additional sophisticated weaponry and a lot of high-tech bells and whistles and gizmos if, in fact, the Israeli-Syrian Golan deal is done as well. That's just, that's what, you know, to you it seems illogical that you would supply weapons as a mediator in order to get to peace. To me, it's, it's the essence of logic. What is it, I mean, what is it that's so illogical? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not your teacher. But I'm just. Okay. You know, I'm just a boy. We can we can well, talk about that later. We can, uh, just, uh, let's get a last yeah. question, and then we can you can chat with Aaron a few minutes afterwards. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it connects somehow, but uh, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, the argument. I think uh, this is this kind of peace uh, you're talking about um, is completely out of history and trends. And you said uh, I, I always left history uh, history apart. Uh, even though I am a historian by profession. And I'm a historian as well, so uh, I kind of uh, disagree with that, especially because it seems like uh, you are on the side of a historical trend, and that's it, a historical trend that wants, first of all, pieces or, or piece of, of the kind I call it, piece of the cemeteries, because it's basically, it's based on, on one side defeat and the other side winning and be able to push some kind of agreement to the other. And if it's not about the Israelis and Arabs, it's about the US and the others. And that's, that's the kind of piece uh, you're looking, uh, you're, you looked for when you're um, doing, when you're in the Secretary of State. So um, I think this is uh, radically different from the, their vision of his history, of the, especially the, the resistance acts, as other colleague call it. Um, that is, we, we cannot accept that kind of peace, and we cannot uh, accept this historical trend that it's this investment the United States has been making, has been making in, in, the, in the region, and, and the existence of Israel itself. So, though it seems really realistic, your, your speech, I think it lacks uh, this autocritical uh, side that's 
this, this historical trend is losing now. It's lost in Iraq, it's lost in, 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 in Afghanistan, and it's going to lose as well in all, right. in all other yeah, places they're trying to, and it's lost in Lebanon as well, when if you came to try to, to uh, push its peace, its own version, version of peace here to the south, and it's losing again. So I think it's it's uh, it's quite it's quite uh, not not sincere from your side to call it uh, not leaving history on the on the table and leaving it aside because I think you have a, histor a historical trend on your side and especially it's a historical trend that relies on economical partnerships and deals economical deals and and all kinds of, of profit making. Uh, U.S. makes and other companies, Israelis, and and that's that's uh, unsurpassable. That that's the I bottom line. I think. Right. We, you know, we have different views of, of where of where the histor arc of history is actually heading. And the reality is, neither of us really know. Neither of us know. I'm not here. I'm here pushing a agreement. First of all, forget peace. That's an illusion. Arabs and Israelis have never had it. They don't have it now, and they're not going to have it. We're talking about political agreements that essentially stop conflict. Maybe over time, through generations, through a process of reconciliation and generational change, the kinds of kind of peace that the French have managed to hammer out with the Germans or the or the Germans and the Russians, which is extraordinary when you think about what these peoples have done to them. The fact that they now have closer relations than the Arabs and the Israelis. It's, remar it's really remarkable. It really is remarkable. And it's worth your thinking through, I think, um, what happens to nations and polities in conflict. I, I mean, I don't know where the historical arc is running. Right. You seem to be suggesting that the, the arc of history and Fortuna is shining on the resistance arc. I mean, I don't, I, 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 I would argue to you, I mean, I'm more inclined to agree with you if by that you mean that Hezbollah and, and Hamas and even Iran have a tremendous capacity to disrupt what you describe as the other historical camp or other historical view. I think they're, they, we've made them taller than they really are, but they do have this capacity. This may only be temporary. This may only be temporary. So I wouldn't invest too heavily. I look, I didn't disavow one religion in order to embrace another. I wouldn't, I wouldn't decry the peacemakers and invest in the resistance. I mean, I'd be very careful, because life is funny. Things really change, and you can never be really certain. I think it was, um, uh, Tennyson, who said there's more honest, more, more faith in honest self-doubt than in half the world's creeds. I mean, my unsolicited advice to you is do not see the world through any one single filter. It's a mistake. It will disappoint you. And the more you believe in it, the harder your fall will be. The world's a complicated place. It really is, I think. And uh, I would just be open, I'm trying to be, more open to all kinds of different things. Because the truth is, I thought I had a lot of the answers, but I don't. Thank you very much. We have to bring it to a close, because we've been <coughs> almost two hours. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, you quoted uh, uh, Michael Jackson, I have to quote that uh, great British political philosopher, Mick Jagger, <laughs> who in one of his songs said, it's the singer, not the song. And I think what you're seeing here today is a dynamic that's very common, which is, it's not what the US does, it's not the policy so much, but that people just don't have credibility or faith or trust in the United States. People see the United States as unfair, self-serving, um, expedient, and not reliable, and this is how politics happens. I mean, we know this is how this is a power game, and I would, I think there's truth in both of the views we're hearing. Uh, 
I don't think we can judge which way history is going. Certainly the resistance front is gaining a lot of support uh, across the region and across the world. I mean, if you look at, if you poll French people and Chinese and Spaniards, they would be probably as critical of the U.S. Uh, if you ask them about Iraq as people in the region. So the criticism of the U.S. are global, but at the same time, I would have to honestly say, I don't see a lot of people, I've never run into anybody who says they want to immigrate to Iran uh, or Syria, um, or they want to uh, live under Islamic types. <coughs> Very few people are moving in that direction. So we have a real tug of war going on here. And that's what makes the Middle East so interesting today. You have a real ideological battle going on. Some of it is very short term. Some of it is, is historic uh, in nature. And this is a process that's ongoing. Our sense is that the most important thing that we can do as a university and as a South Fedders Institute and the Bill and Sally Hambrick Distinguished Peacemakers Lecture Series is precisely what we've done today, is to hear different views, hear an honest analysis from past experience, and try to understand this dynamic more accurately uh, in the hope of all of us somehow playing a role in trying to achieve what we all want to achieve, which is justice above all for all people, and simultaneously, not sequentially, not for the Israelis first and then for the Palestinians or the Lebanese, um, not for one, not for the Americans first, and then the Arabs, not for uh, somebody and then the Iranians, but um, simultaneously. And this is tough, uh, but it's a process that we hope to contribute to through what we're doing. And I thank you all for coming. I thank Aaron Miller, Bill and Sally Hembrick, and Tom Ferris, and